Um, so I'm going to start this uh, conversation, and those who uh, actually were in the Rhodesian Air Force or whatever, uh, you're not allowed to answer this question, all right? So I'll start off with this guy. Take a look at him. And I'll just read what it says here. I joined the RAF in 1942, but wasn't born in the UK. I flew Spitfires in the Western Desert, the Middle East, and Italy. An accident on takeoff whilst in the Western Desert left me with facial burns. I was shot down behind enemy lines over Italy, where I was assisted by Italian partisans. I spent three months working with the local resistance small movement and learned to speak Italian. In later life, I entered politics and made many friends based on my war record. You also made a few enemies too, by the way. Uh, now, just hang on to that, and I'll come back to that later after the break, and I'll uh, relieve you of your misery if you don't know what I'm talking about. Right, continuing on. There's a, I know there's a few people in here who don't know too much about Africa, so I thought I'd start off with just giving you an overview. And um, as you can see from this uh, diagram, it's the world's second largest continent. It's nearly four times the size of Australia. And uh, there you have it, it's about 30.3 million square kilometers. And it's surrounded by the Mediterranean saying, this is just, I'm reading this as it came off the website, but it's general knowledge anyway. But uh, if you haven't had the opportunity to look at that or had any reason to, it <coughs> give you some idea what we're talking about. And um, it compares to Australia there, which is a much smaller country. And interesting when you say things like that. And the big thing about Africa, as you see on the bottom slide, it has between 1,000 and 2,000 languages, which is not bad going. There are 56 countries in Africa. And the diversity of the African languages is evidenced by the population. In total, uh, I've put 75 languages, but I think there's more, and uh, uh, which have more than one million speak. Uh, speak. The striped uh, parts of that uh, picture, by the way, are where they're multi-language. They're not just single languages, they're multi-speaking languages. So this is just a lead up to what I'm going to talk about because just to set the scene and just going back to the top uh, diagram again you'll see on the left hand side uh, in Australia we have 250 Aboriginal tribes they call them mobs in Africa there are 3,000 just to give some comparison so how the hell did I uh, land up in Africa Basically because of this. If you have a look at that map on the left hand side, every single country in Africa, with the exception of Ethiopia, was colonized. Every one of them. And they were all by European countries, of course. France, Spain, Italy, Portugal, Belgium, Germany, and of course Britain. On the right hand side shows you the British colonists in, uh, under the British rule. So, where does this go to? Well, in 1960, Harold Macmillan, who was the Conservative Prime Minister in UK, decided uh, with, uh, there's too much trouble happening in Africa now, uh, things were getting out of control, uh, there was a lot of tribal fighting, but there was a lot of kickback against uh, colonialization for all the reasons you can think of. So, he went to uh, Cape Town and delivered this very famous speech called The Winds of Change, where he announced the end of colonization in Africa, as far as he was concerned. Uh, it was well received by all the, most of the African countries, not quite so with uh, South Africa and Rhodesia, which we'll come on to later. And that happened on the 3rd of February in 1960. So, how does this carry on forward. Well, Northern Rhodesia, as you can see there, uh, it, it's showing you it as Zambia now, but Northern Rhodesia is a landlocked country, as is Zaire above it, Zimbabwe below it, Nyasaland to the right of it, which is now Malawi, of course, 
And uh, so there was quite a few uh, problems uh, uh, that, with their trade routes, but we'll come to that later. Anyway, when they got their independence in the 24th of October in 64, uh, the, they elected Kenneth Gwanda, who you see on the right hand side there, um, for no other reason than they thought he was the right man for the job. He was an ex school teacher. He was born, or his parents came from Nyasaland, or it was now Malawi, and he migrated across to when that northern Rhodesia, as it was then. Um, he had no great leanings in political circles or to tribal affairs, but he did believe that uh, the African population was getting a raw deal. And he did push the, um, uh, the idea of a uh, better deal for the Africans. In actual fact, uh, as I say, in um, he, he was a shoo-in to become a future president because in um, uh, 1955, he was in prison for two months for distributing what was then called subversive literature. Well, as we know from Nelson Mandela, that's a sure way of becoming president at the right time, which he did. And So, in 1964, the call went out for volunteers in the UK for civilian and RAF personnel to volunteer or be seconded to Zambia and assist with them with this changeover from uh, the colonial days of uh, Northern Rhodesia to the new independent country of Zambia. Zambia named after the Zambezi, just out of my interest. And, uh, they sent out um, engineers, academics, teachers, and the such like. And um, they also asked for uh, 80, around about 80 to 100 uh, RAF personnel to also volunteer to help them get started with an Air Force. Well, I was only a year out of training myself, and I uh, was just a lowly air wireless mechanic, and I thought, well, why not? And so, this is new venture in life, as they always said, join the RAF and see the world. Well, it was a good place to start. Never heard of Zambia, and neither anybody else. And um, we did find out eventually that it was formerly Northern Rhodesia, <laughs> and the place that they would be based would be in Livingston, right alongside Victoria Falls. Well, I thought, well, that can't be too bad. So I signed up. And uh, within a few weeks, I was on my way. Um, now, in 64, as we all know, the, the airline industry was basically in transit from the big, uh, from props, and uh, turbo props, things like that, to jets. Um, there was still a lot of turbo prop aircraft flying around, and uh, the airline uh, that they chose for me to fly out there because there was no direct routes to uh, Zambia in those days. It was a bit circuitous to say the least. And so uh, the, the uh, aircraft that you see here uh, on the left, British United run the uh, uh, Britannias. Uh, they were usually used for uh, European um, holiday makers and then uh, closed down for winter. but. They did stitch up a, a contract with the British government to transport uh, service families and personnel to Europe and beyond. And so uh, they were constantly on the move um, uh, for that purpose. The other aircraft, as you see, there was an East African Air uh, Airlines uh, Fokker Friendship. It was a good little uh, pond hopper down the east coast of Africa. And of course, the bottom one, the biggest Viscount, well, it, it, once again, turboprop was very useful for its time. Um, in, as I put here, in 1964, they did start a direct service from London to um, Lusaka using BC 10s, although the first flight, I believe, was to Johannesburg. Um, but that got started in late 64, and uh, that set the scene for future travel to Africa. So, looking at this, the first leg 
of this air uh, flight out there went left Gatwick and went via Valletta in Malta. Uh, the RAF still had a station there, Luca, RAF Luca, and then uh, it would refuel there, drop a few people off, and carry on down to Nairobi. And at the time, the international airport was in Bakazi. In Bakazi is just like a suburb like Ascot is, and uh, later on they changed it to Yoma Kenyatta International. And as you see there, the flying time was about eight and a half hours between um, Malta and Nairobi. And um, the, the, after that, we would travel down the coast uh, via Mombasa, Dar es Salaam, Blantyre, landing up in Salisbury, which was the capital as named in Rhodesia at that time, before carrying on to Livingston. You can see the sort of countries that this flew across, which is in the news just lately. Sudan, not such a happy place. And Libya before that. Um, it wasn't a very fast moving aeroplane, the Britannia, but uh, it was quite a popular one. And uh, in later life, I was doing major services on these type. Interesting thing about that, uh, in this next slide you'll see, uh, Livingston Airport is exactly 12 kilometres away from the falls, about the same distance as uh, Freo to Rottnest. And uh, as you took off from there, the first thing you would see is the spray from Victoria Falls in the background. And the locals called it Masiotania, which is their African name for the smoke that thunders. And if you actually stand next to it, you can understand why they called it that. So I'll just tell you a little bit about Livingston, which is, uh, as soon as we was, I was posted there, I, it was an absolutely fantastic place at the time. We're talking 64, remember? And it was a long time, it was before the real trouble started. Uh, uh, one of the big Kaiser was talking about in Angola and Rhodesia. So basically, this is Livingston, uh, named after the, the guy himself in 1813. The main streets there are always very wide, and as you can see, dual carriageway. And uh, the reason I put these couple of uh, images in is that uh, when we arrived in Livingston, we were greeted by a small gang of or contingent of ex Rhodesian Air Force guys who had now just uh, along with a couple of others, uh, South African guys had joined the Zambian Air Force. It was, remember, it had only just been put together, very within months of me arriving there. So they insisted that we congregate at the Le Fairmount Hotel, which is down on the bottom left hand corner, so I thought this was a good way to start a new posting. And I think I saw the accommodation I was staying at about five hours later. Um, and as I've just said here, the, it was named after David Livingston, who you remember was a Scottish missionary and a medical doctor who explored much of the interior of Africa, reaching the Victoria Falls, November 17th, 1855. It was later when uh, the journalist H. Stanley from the New York Times followed them after there, being no contact 
worked with him for quite a few years, uh, actually met him and came out with those famous words, Dr. Lew Livingston, I presume. It's about the size, or it was about the size of Rockingham Livingston. It wasn't a very big place. It was somewhere between Rockingham and Mandurah in size. And it was made up of the contingent of people who were living there were mainly Afri uh, Jewish, Greek, Indian and expats. I think a lot of the Jewish population there were uh, fled there just after the war or in the war years. The African population, of course, the, um, made up of Bantu and Lozi, I think, were the local people. Um, the in but the influx of the RAF personnel were welcomed by the local community and offered their trade-related assistance in areas such as car repairs and servicing in their spare time. This was made possible because we only worked from 7 o'clock in the morning till 1 o'clock in the afternoon. That was a bonus. And I became the town's uh, cinema projectionist, radio repairman, and uh, auto electrician. Didn't have any television in those days. Um, Livingstone has its own version of the RSO. It was called the Moth Club. A uh, member of the Tin Hat basically runs along the same lines as the RSL. And my uh, only interaction there was when I got killed hauled into there to act as Father Christmas. I must have been the youngest Father Christmas ever existed. I think I was 19 at the time. And the only reason they got me to do that because none of the kids knew who I was. And even with a beard on, and uh, they, they all give me some funny looks, but uh, no, I managed to get away with it. I think. Playing golf was interesting. Uh, it best played out of the rough, because you may have Jew guides here. They have black mambas over there, three times as big. They're not black, by the way, they're brown. And they're a bit more aggressive, so you best well cut out of the rough. So, the makeup of the uh, Zambian Air Force. There you are. It was made up, basically, of Rhodesian, ex-Rhodesian, South African, and, of course, the new intake of RAF personnel. And percentage-wise, there was only uh, a low percentage of Rhodesian and South African. Pilots, I would say, was an even split, 50-50, half RAF, and the other half South African, Rhodesian, expats, and that sort of thing. Uh, later on, we did get a, an RAF doctor come along and an education officer who also uh, were well received into the uh, community there, offering their services alongside the, uh, the traders, if you want to put it that way. The structure of the Air Force was very loosely along the lines of the RAF, in as much as the CO was a wing commander, he had an engineer and officer, squadron leader. The pilots were a mixture of um, young and old. Um, I think a few of the older pilots who went out there, some of them were master pilots, and they were just seeing their time out. They were probably given the choice of uh, flying a desk back in England or getting the, having a last hurrah in Africa and uh, training um, the locals and also flying the aircraft. The, uh, the transport aircraft, which I'll talk about in a minute. So these were the aeroplanes. This was the Zambian Air Force, ACA, 1964. Not one gunship amongst them, right? They had six chipmunks, four beavers, four caribou, four DC-3s, three of them, you could probably call them C-47s because there was no linings in them. They were just fitted out for freighting. One of the DC-3s came ex Alitalia, and it had a lining inside and decent seats, so they used that for transporting people more than freight. There were two Pembrokes, which I have no idea why they would have put them there, because they were absolutely useless. Spent more time with the cowlins off than in. One of the only aeroplanes I know that has pneumatic undercarriage and, and uh, hydraulic uh, windscreen wipers. Uh, <laughs> The, um, the, the HS-748 that you see in the bottom right hand side, uh, they didn't get that till 67 and that became the presidential aircraft and it was the only turboprop they had. These images, by the way, were taken by myself and the quality was as good as the aeroplanes. <laughs> and uh, 
they were donated, the, chipmunk, the chipmunks and uh, the DC-3s were basically gifted to the Z uh, Zambian Air Force. Um, I think the DC-3s came ex-Rhodesian Air Force. The chipmunks, I think, ex-RAF. The beavers were bought brand new from de Havilland in Canada, as were the caribou. As you can see on there, uh, well, they were right for the time. And as I put in the bottom right hand corner there, the beaver has been quoted, and I'm sure there's a lot of people would agree with it, one of the best bush aircraft ever made. The great thing about it, it had a good payload, lots of power, and um, its range wasn't bad either for what it was. And of course, they were all, except for the chippy radial engines. I'm going to look at an interesting turn in events in Zambia. Uh, up till this time, um, everything was going along really, really well. We were out there to, as uh, so I say, train the local Africans that they started bringing in. And the, most of the pilots shared their time between uh, flying DC-3s and caribou and training on the uh, uh, chippiers were the basic trainers, whereas the uh, beavers were the more advanced trainers. I never actually saw one of the Africans fly anything bigger than that whilst I was there, but that's not to say they didn't. The next part of my time there uh, was really interesting because uh, due to what was happening in Rhodesia, in the south of the border, uh, there was quite a bit of uh, shift in the way they operated in the Zambian Air Force and it caused a lot of trouble for the Zambians themselves. Back to the memory test again. Did anybody work out who this was? No, if you were Rhodesian you're not allowed to say. Yes, he uh, retired uh, to Cape Town in the end and uh, that's where he wrote his uh, great betrayal and there's a lot of kind of these people here could tell you much, a lot more about him than I could uh, if knowing that better. What happened in 66 was, uh, this is where all the things started to change rapidly. Uh, up till uh, Ian Smith, of the, in the um, Rhodesian government, did, well first of all let's start off with the population of Rhodesia at the time. Uh, there were about 200,000 whites, and we'll call them whites because there were 4 million blacks. And if I can just put it as simple as that. They had a minority government, but they were very, very successful in marketing. They used to their sales overseas in uh, agriculture, uh, tobacco, minerals, things like that, where they were well known for. And uh, would you believe it, Britain was one of their biggest customers. And they exported, 30% uh, of Zambia's in, um, imports came from Rhodesia. What happened was, uh, he didn't agree with the way things were going. Uh, there's this commitment to majority rule in all countries in Africa after uh, decolonization. He could only just see it, or the Rhodesian government saw it being a total disaster uh, for, from what they set up there. So he had many meetings with uh, Harold Wilson, who was the Labour Prime Minister at that time. And these included uh, trips on board the HMS Tiger at uh, Gibraltar, as you see there. And there were a few others. But it all came to nothing. Uh, they just could not come to middle ground. And then he famously brought out this, or the Rhodesian government, this unilateral de proclamation of independence. What that actually meant was that he'd actually said, we're going to break away from Britain and form our own independent country. We still think the Queen's a good person, so you know we remain a royalist, as it were. But they, they just couldn't get on with Britain. Now, here's a question for you. When do you think this happened last in Britain, where the country broke away? <coughs> Yeah. Try USA. And that was the last time it happened. And they weren't about to allow it to happen again. So what they actually did is uh, the African, uh, Britain had a lot of pressure on them by the UN. They said, uh, you know, you've got to do something about it. And uh, the African countries went even boots and all and said, well, let's take military action if you have to. Harold Wilson said no, 
uh, you had a real contentious issue here. You've got a, somebody who was a, a war hero, Ian Smith. You had a country, you still had a governor. The people, the civil servants there were working for the British government. And uh, Britain was a customer. So you can imagine it was a total nightmare for them. So Barrel and his, uh, he said, right, what we'll do, we'll put economic sanctions on the Rhodesia. That will bring them round and maybe we can come to some uh, mutual agreement. But it didn't work. What followed next was um, a disaster for Zambia because, remember, they're both landlocked countries. Zambia, Rhodesia, were both landlocked countries. Zambia had a train route through to the coast which just happened to go through Rhodesia, which was set up when they were Northern Rhodesia and Southern Rhodesia. And Northern Rhodesia used to pay Southern Rhodesia for the purposes of the, for the train travel. But when this embargo or this financial embargo was put on the country, uh, they weren't allowed to trade with Rhodesia. And actually the funds that they used to pay Rhodesia were frozen in a Lusaka bank account. So Rhodesia said, no pay, no gain, you know, you can't use our railway. They were really in strife. If you take a look at this picture on the left, this is, illustrates just the sort of route that would have been taken for the copper producers. See, a lot of copper came from the north of uh, Zambia in Podindola uh, there, which is the main place it came from. The port of Byra is on the um, right-hand side of uh, South Africa. And it's owned by the Portuguese, or in Portuguese, Mozambique. And that's basically where most of the import-export uh, for Rhodesia and Zambia went through. They had a, a, a trade, a, a, the train used to run down between, started in Lola where the copper was, and through um, Rhodesia down to the, Zam uh, the uh, Mozambique uh, area, down to Bayra, sorry. And uh, the other place it used to export it through was Durban. Uh, this obviously was set up in colonial times, so it was never going to be a problem, so they thought. Uh, but um, the interesting thing was when uh, Britain declared this uh, idea of putting an embargo on Russia, on, uh, <laughs> wash my mouth, um, on, on Rhodesia, uh, what they didn't uh, bank on was just how many friends Rhodesia had. And well to the south, uh, South Africa and Mozambique wasn't that particularly interested in putting embargoes on there. And there were other countries too, which were not even associated with Africa, France, Bulgaria, a few others didn't agree with what was going on. So they just turned a blind eye to it. And basically Rhodesia didn't suffer too much at all. Um, but Zambia did. And uh, so the other thing was that at that time, we're talking 1964 now, what is now Namibia was Southwest Africa. And the people who looked, you know, it was a toss up between who looked after that, you Germans, English, South Africans. And uh, they had a port there called Walvis Bay. And Walvis Bay also started to become a very important route for Rhodesia for transporting in, import and out export of goods into Rhodesia. And I can tell you firsthand, I was in Livingston at the time, and this is 1966 we're talking about, uh, there was hardly any notable <coughs> difference other than the fact they did bring in petrol rationing. There were a few uh, goods in the shops, which were hard to get. And I bought myself a, a, a Ford Anglia for my travels. <laughs> and the cylinder head had a cracked a cylinder head on it. And they used to bring all the spare parts in from Rhodesia. The main distributor was in Bulawayo, which is about 300 miles to the south. And they weren't allowed to do that. No, that wasn't any great problem because the, our DC-3s used to fly up to Nairobi on a regular basis. So just jump on board, pick one up, and bring it back. It was easy. As I said, the um, what to do next? Well, things started to change with the Zambian Air Force. 
And they suddenly find themselves flying to areas they'd never thought of before. And uh, for instance, uh, the countries to the north suddenly became very interesting to them. And so we used to fly up to Nigeria, to um, Nairobi, Dar es Salaam, um, uh, via Blantyre and also Uganda. Uh, I think mainly for um, refueling stops, those two last ones. But um, the president of Tanzania was a guy called Julius Nigeri, and he seemed to be a good mate of uh, Kenneth Kaunda, and they said, well, let's get together and build a railway. So from Dar es Salaam to Ndola, then you can ship all your copper out and bring it backwards and forwards. And they say, great idea, who's going to pay for it? Now, the distance between Ndola and uh, Dar es Salaam is about 1,300, 30, you know, about 1,300 miles across a very rough country, to say the least. I mean, you, you, when they say tiger country, I mean, it was rough. And uh, so they approached the World Bank, who turned them down. He approached Russia, who turned them down. And guess who came to the fore? China. They said, not only will we give you the money, we'll build it for you. And not only that, we'll use our own labor, and we'll have it finished in six years. And they did. So they built this new railway. But before this actually happened, because this happened a fair bit after I left Africa, uh, we were flying backwards and forwards in our DC-3s and in the Caribou, uh, taking people, we taking politicians and what have you up there to uh, talk Turkey with the northern neighbours, and also uh, essential services between um, Nairobi, uh, Dar es Salaam, backwards and forwards uh, to uh, Lusaka and Ndola and places like that. And I've got a a, a really good picture here is halfway across Tanzania once uh, we were flying and they lost an engine in a DC-3 so no problem uh, they landed at this little airport up in the middle of uh, uh, Tanzania called Tabora and uh, we loaded up a caribou with an engine borrowed the uh, tripod from the engine workshops uh, uh, the railway workshops block and tackle sent the relative clue up there, did crew, to just change the engine. And uh, all the locals turned out in uh, Tabora, never seen anything like this. It was this entertainment for a year, this was. And they were very happy to come and lend a hand uh, and offload the engine off the caribou and put it onto the DC-3. Now, if you remember back, I'm not sure if I emphasized this right at the start, the number of pilots that the Zambian Air Force had, it was around about 18, and I'm being quite generous about that. You wouldn't think about it too much. Every aeroplane, such as a DC-3 and a Caribou, is a two-man crew. So if you had eight aeroplanes in the air at once, there's 16 people taken up, am I right? On top of this, they still had to do their training with the uh, beavers and the chipmunks, for, that's what they went out there, to train the locals how to fly. So they were getting a bit light on when it came to the, the pilots. Not a problem. They had a few grand crew there who looked pretty uh, uh, intelligent. They could, they could uh, do the job of second pilot, no problem. And believe it or not, um, that's exactly what they did. So I landed up uh, flying second pilot in a, as a DC-3. How easy could it be? All you needed to do was read out the checklist, operate the undercarriage, pump the hydraulics up and down again, and uh, read the, as I say, read the checks. You know, just don't ask me to fly it. And the other things that they used to get them to do was uh, they become pseudo flight engineers. I think they used that term just to square it with people when they were flying into other countries, but. That came about by the fact that up in Indola one day, uh, they were filling up a DC-3, and the uh, refueler uh, thought it was quite all right to fill it up with jet fuel. <laughs> and uh, the word goes out that they did the fastest circuit ever at Indola, because the temperature gauges wrapped themselves around the stops. After which they said, well, 
I think it'd be a good idea if we send our guys out to make sure that doesn't happen again. And so they doubled as uh, like load masters. We used to watch uh, what was going on, what was coming off, and uh, do the pre-flight, after-flight checks on the aircraft, and also just check that they put the right fuel in. That would be good stuff. Yeah. And quite a few of us did that. Can you imagine that happening today, of course? When I left there, the Zambian Air Force, uh, well, all hell broke loose. Uh, a few years after I left, as Big Kaiser has told you about Angola, and it was already little been known to us just um, starting up the troubles just before we left. And also in Rhodesia, uh, you all know about the terrorist organizations that started up there, and especially in the time of Mugabe, but that, that came later. Um, uh, so there was incursions into Zambia, there was uh, the Rhodesians uh, you know, chasing terrorists across the border in Zambia. I, I wasn't part of any of that because by that time I'd actually left. But if you looked at the um, uh, situation there now, the Zambian Air Force is another beast altogether. Obviously, in 1970, uh, had lost, uh, he lost it with the British government. He wasn't happy because um, the economy of Zambia was going down the drain. He thought that uh, Britain didn't do enough in the early days uh, with the uh, UDI thing. He wanted them to take a military stance there, and Harold Wilson said, no way. And uh, so in 1970, the RAF party company with the ZAF, and instead they brought in people from Yugoslavia and Russia to replace them. The upshot of that was uh, they uh, then ordered, I don't know where they got the money from. If, if you looked at the um, uh, fleet of aircraft there now, you have very unusual names of aircraft, jacks and buttons, you know, terrible. If you want to really find out what happens, I, I sort of urge you to have a look at the internet and look at how things transpired from there. The things have moved on, of course, and the exports of copper went back up again um, because eventually, uh, uh, in the last few years anyway, things settled down. They started transporting copper via uh, all, all places. They went to Walvis Bay, uh, up to uh, Dar es Salaam, down to Byra, Durban, and uh, things started getting on the road. But biggest trouble that uh, they had a great deal of trouble servicing these routes and uh, because of the financial side and whatever, uh, they just couldn't keep their hand on the uh, how to keep them in good shape. But they seemed to get by. It was never the same again as it was then. The actual railway they built is called the Tazara Railway. It's called the Freedom Railway in, your, in other terms. And it now supports tourism more than anything else, um, backwards and forwards from Dar es Salaam to a place called Mposhi, which is basically a, a small town in between Andola and uh, it used to be called Brogan Hill, but it's now called Cabway. And uh, it's become quite popular as a tourist uh, thing to do, like the blue train in South Africa. Uh, there's also been a pipeline built between Dar es Salaam and uh, Andola also by the Chinese, I believe. And there's a second one in, in the, being built. Um, the latest thing I saw there was that they're trying to import oil from Angola. Uh, because up till then, they've been coming in from the Middle East, like most people. People who are visiting Zambia, uh, now you see them advertised in the papers for the princely sum of ten thousand dollars you can go and see the victoria falls and uh, or go on the blue train same price <laughs> it's quite funny for me because uh, we used to think oh not victoria falls again let's, let's go somewhere different but that's what the price you'd pay these days and i've got a 
Once again, a slide here which I'm, I'll read from what I've just put here. Beware of fake news. I found an article on the web which said that the DC-3s that I was working on and flew in were all written off in 1964. Well, I must have been working on ghost aeroplanes then. They were alive and well when I was there. So where they got that information, I don't know. Although, uh, obviously, they've gone out to pasture, most of them now, they, uh, they've been written, you know, just past their use by date. Not all things revolve around the Zambian Air Forces, uh, you could have seen from the image. Um, so in March this year, I celebrated my 54th wedding anniversary with the girl I made there, meant there. She was at school at the time. I wasn't much older. Uh, uh, but on a final note, I, I consider the opportunity of being just a small part of the history there a privilege, and I don't take it lightly. I know it could never be repeated purely on the unique, uniqueness of the situation that went on. And uh, if we can believe the news coming out of Zambia now, it appears progress, especially with tourism, is on the rise. I'd like to think that the game parks, wildlife and Victoria Falls are all on your bucket list and uh, you enjoy them as much as I did. Thank you for listening. Thank you.